I'm Bill Hamilton. I've been asked to uh, serve as your moderator for this uh, panel, and you'll be glad to know that uh, you'll remember last night the panel did not show up <laughs> for uh, Ed Berger, but I'm really glad this panel showed up today because I couldn't make the presentation that Ed Berger made last night, and this panel will be your lead today. Uh, I work for uh, Harry Lucas and the Educational Advancement Foundation as a management consultant. As you know, you've heard from me before about some of the strategic planning work we've been doing over the last uh, few years, and part of that has been to focus on the history, the accomplishments of the uh, centers, and uh, as well as the future of the centers uh, uh, based on those accomplishments and how the community has evolved and the needs uh, for education. Uh, <clears throat> the panel this, uh, title is, What Have We Learned About IBL at the Centers? As this panel evolves in the after, uh, throughout the discussion, my suggestion is probably the title maybe could be modified to say, what can we all learn about IBL from the centers? And so we'll have kind of a two-part presentation here this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to let Ron Douglas, the primary uh, liaison for the Board of Trustees of the Educational Foundation, make a few introductions. And then uh, at first, we'll uh, have Sandra Larson give an uh, update on some of the uh, uh, documentation of accomplishments that she uh, would like to share with us this afternoon. And then after that, uh, some of the centers may give uh, a little update on, on their, their view of their accomplishments. And then we will engage in some questions. Those questions will be styled in such a way as if they're coming from, from you all. So rather than hearing from me, rather than hearing from uh, them, we'll pose some questions that are styled from you all, because I'm considering you all as folks that want to walk away from here this afternoon, wanting to go home and form either a center or something like it to convince folks where you are, maybe even yourself, of what's possible to be done with IBL uh, back home. So trying to make this uh, sort of customer friendly uh, and uh, something that you can take home, which is always the goal. So uh, at this point, I'll introduce uh, Ron Douglas. Thank you, Bill. Uh, about a little more than 10 years ago, as many of you who have been here before know, EF decided to fund five, IBL projects at five research universities. You've heard from year to year some of the things they've been doing. The main reason for doing this was in order to provide models for IBL as more than just one person to provide possibilities for experimentation and to provide a base for assessment and evaluation. Well, as I said, we've been at it for 10 years, and what we're going to try to do is look back a little bit today as to what we've been what we've accomplished and what we've learned. I'll let you start, with, as Bill said, with Sandra Larson. Good afternoon. I jumped up and down and said I want to go first because I have some new results to share with you that I haven't talked about before with this audience about what have we learned about student learning. And this, I think, underpins the kinds of things that my colleagues will talk about in terms of what have we learned about encouraging and supporting faculty to take these things up in their own classrooms um, and to uh, teach skillfully with IBL. So I want to first acknowledge the colleagues who worked on this study. Uh, the study was based at the centers in terms of our sampling, but I think uh, you should feel that the results are very much your own as well. There are certainly variations in context, but uh, an important thing I have, I think, uh, that I want to leave you with is that these are results you can use for yourself. Um, so I want to acknowledge Maria Lisa Hatsi, Marina Kogan, and Tim Weston especially, and Sarah Huff also worked with us on this, uh, one of the pieces I'll talk about. And let me just point out that the website down there is where you can find out more about any of our research findings. Uh, first, before I start talking about the findings, just want to say I'm proud to be an American today. Uh, we organized this study 
uh, around three big questions. What do students learn from IBL classes in terms of the range of content, thinking and problem solving skills, their attitudes and beliefs, the, the ways it influences their career as they go forward? But in order to answer that question, we also need to know what's happening to them in an IBL class. So the, the diagram here is, looks at what do students experience, how do they tell us about their learning, the way class time is used, how they interact, um, and how do instructors teach. And that includes both what they're doing that accounts for that student experience, but also the ways they learn to teach, which I think is an important piece of what we've been able to watch at the centers as well. And I want to point out that we gathered lots of different kinds of data. We surveyed students. We interviewed students. We interviewed instructors. We observed their classes. Uh, we gave some tests in cases where we had enough students to taking a common course that we could get test data. We looked at their academic transcripts. Um, so we've got a bunch of different kinds of data that each speak to different parts of these questions. So I'm not going to give you all the results today. I'm going to give you a snapshot of a few things. And you know, it's a little bit against my grain to sort of tell you the result with telling, without telling you much about how we got there. But that's, that's the amount of time we have today. And I'll encourage you to, again, read the papers and, and uh, look into these things more. So what I can say that we've already learned, things I've talked about at this meeting in the past, I talked uh, some about this yesterday. Um, IBL instruction does vary in detail, but there are some common core features that, that make it a thing that, that you have in common with each other. It's not just uh, free range teaching. There are some core principles. We know that IBL is good for students um, uh, in general, but it's also especially good for women and for uh, students who come into your courses already uh, lower achieving, so the, the, the bottom of the class, so to speak. Um, this seems to have particular benefit. We know that as they go forward after an IBL experience, uh, students, um, uh, especially early career students, students who have an IBL experience early in their college time, freshmen or sophomores, um, are more likely to persist with mathematics courses. And we also know, again, those lower achieving students um, are more likely to succeed better in later courses. They take lasting gains with them out of the IBL course into the next thing. And finally, we know something about the pieces that come up over and over and over again in all the data sets are what I call the twin pillars. Deep engagement with meaningful mathematics. That means time to think about important problems, not solving 32 of them for tomorrow, but a few <coughs> problems that are well thought out and really get to the things you care about. And then collaborative processing of those ideas, right? And whether that's through class discussion, through small group work, uh, through their informal act interactions outside class, um, that collaborative sense making is really important for students. Okay, this is sort of a schematic of the study. Uh, four centers are the four rows, and all of them taught IBO courses of, of one or both of two types. What we call math track courses are those for the math majors and the STEM majors, the engineering students, people who are taking a fair amount of math. Um, it could be beginning or later students, but the math track courses. Some of them also taught pre-service teachers courses, courses that are focused on preparing students who are going into elementary or secondary teaching. And then some of them also taught the same courses as non-IBL. Okay, so we have a comparison group here um, of the non-IBL courses, which uh, you'll, when, when we look at those courses, they're really mostly lecture-based. And so part of the point here is that we've got a lot of variation, a lot of kinds of courses. So this is a messy study, but that means um, in, in a weird way, that means the findings are more reliable because if we can fish a signal out of this messiness, um, it must be a pretty strong signal. The past work I've talked about mostly focuses on those IBL and non-IBL comparisons in the math track group. We don't have a comparison group for the pre-service teachers because nobody who was teaching IBL for pre-service teachers was also teaching a non-IBL section of the same thing, right? So the belief was these are good for pre-service teachers. We're going to do all of them this way. Okay, so today I want to talk with you a bit about some new, new work, a uh, paper that's just been accepted that will, should be coming out soon, um, about the pre-service teacher courses in particular. And I'll just call to your attention the color scheme at the bottom here I'm going to be using repeatedly. The non-IBL math track group is sort of turquoise, the IBL math track group is purple, the IBL pre-service teacher courses are green. And again, I'm, I'm going to keep saying courses, right? We're not separating by students. Students in math track courses might intend to be high school teachers, but we're looking at the course they were in, not the student themselves. So I'll talk, be doing, talking today about this group of the pre-service teachers at two of the institutions and some of the data from observations, surveys, and tests. All right, so first of all, I want to convince you that IBL courses for pre-service teachers look pretty much like IBL for math track students. There are some variations, but overall, these are various measures we have from the classroom observation. 
Um, IBL courses um, do a lot of student-centered work. Students are doing the work. So again, what you're looking here for is the purple and the green, IBL math track, IBL pre-service teachers. And what you see is those are much more alike than they are from the blue, which are the non-IBL courses. Uh, the IBL instructors spend less time talking than the traditional uh, non-IBL courses. Uh, students um, take the lead more often in the courses. More students ask questions. Um, they also, more students ask questions in an IBL class, and also individual students ask more questions, right? To see how those are different, counting students or counting questions. And IBL courses change gears more often. So the point of this graph is just to show you that it's kind of the same thing. There are variations. What are the variations? Well, one of them is that the pre-service teacher courses are more likely to use small group work and, and spend less time with students at the board presenting individually. And that's an adaptation that the teachers told us uh, was, was specific. That's a group that sometimes is less confident in mathematics and that small group work was seen as a good way to have them work together and develop their ideas um, and less stressful in some cases than getting up at the board by themselves. So that's one difference we saw in the frequency of group work. The other difference we saw is that the instructors in the pre-service courses were more likely to use um, short prepared lectures Right? So some of the talking they did was spontaneous and explaining and so on, but they were also more likely to sort of frame the activity and wrap it up in a planful way. Um, so we saw a little bit of difference there. But overall, these classes look a lot alike. IBL is IBL. All right, so here are some of the data from the results. Um, when we ask students about their learning gains, so this is a survey where we say, how much did you gain in this or that skill? What you see, this is kind of a fun one, it's dividing up, again, those lower achievers are in the darkest red, the highest achievers, those with the best grades coming into the course, are the palest color of red. And what you see is that those lower achievers are reporting the highest gains. They feel like this course benefited them more than do the higher achieving students. It's, everybody benefits, right? But the low achievers are perceiving the greatest benefit um, across different skill sets, thinking and learning kinds of uh, things, teaching, confidence, persistence, right? So some attitudes as well as some skills. Now what's fun is that for this particular group, we have test data that can back this up. So not only do they feel like they're learning more, we can also uh, give them a test at the beginning and the end and compare the scores. And we see, so this is breaking them out, the, the uh, lowest achievers are on the left. That's the group who had half or fewer of the pretest questions right. And uh, the high achievers are on the right, the people with the highest scores at the beginning. And the low achievers' scores improve the most, right? So comparing the dark green pre-test to the light green post-test. And this is a test that is um, called the LMT, Learning Mathematics for Teaching. It's a very well validated, very carefully prepared test that is intended for use with in-service teachers, teachers who are in the classroom. So a test you might use to show their gains in professional development, a summer institute, and so on. Uh, we're using it here with pre-service teachers, which is not quite how it's intended to be used. But the reason we used it is that this test has been related to teachers' success in teaching students, right? So a good score on this test um, is connected with higher performance of the students, the elementary school students of that teacher. So this is a test that really is linked, linking the math knowledge of teachers to the performance of their own pupils, their own school children, right? So a good score on this test should be telling us that these pre-service teachers are well prepared. And these are good scores, and their improvements are very nice. All right, the other thing I want to mention to you is um, a new findings coming out, a paper that was just published in April, and it fits beautifully into the theme of this conference about empowerment. So again, here's the scheme, the sort of comparison groups and, and study groups we have. In this case, we're focusing on the interview data, just the interviews, from all of the IBL students, um, including math track and pre-service groups together. Um, this is a fairly large interview study. We've got interviews with 68 students. Some of them are in focus groups of two or three. Um, and the um, pie over there on the left is showing you that some of them are pre-service teacher students, the green slice of the pie. The dark purple slice of the pie is the IBL math track students in upper level courses. And the light purple slice is the sort of freshmen, the students in freshman courses. <coughs> so you can see we have a coverage across different kinds of students. And the analysis that my colleague Margalisa Hasi uh, led, um, she used the lens of empowerment to talk about the interview data. So what is empowerment? She divided it into three kinds, personal empowerment, cognitive empowerment, social empowerment. What does that mean? Well, 
Personal empowerment has to do with how you feel about what you know and how you are able to use what you know. Um, so it's positive self-perceptions. We know that this is very strongly connected to people's ability to actually use math in their lives and their sense of themselves as able to do math. Agency and self-regulation has to do with control. I, I, know, I know how to learn things. I can take action. I can be uh, a person who, who decides what to do and gets it done. And enjoyment, fun, joy. I think uh, Ed Berger talked about joy last night. Um, this is a piece of empowerment, personal empowerment. So this is what's going on in their heads, how they feel. right? And we don't talk about feelings very much in math, but it's really important. It has a lot to do with student success. And the percentages here are the percentages of interviews um, in, or uh, percentages of students who mention this idea. So in other words, high numbers of students mention these things, right? These are strong, strong patterns across the data set. Uh, cognitive empowerment has to do with thinking skills and problem solving skills, especially students' awareness that they have improved thinking skills um, that they can use. So it's again, being able to use these skills. And social empowerment is uh, <coughs> two things, social competence, ability to interact fruitfully with people around mathematics and skilled communication. All right, so I'm gonna focus, focus first just a bit on personal empowerment. And I'm gonna have you, uh, we coded a large amount of data. There are over, there are nearly 600 comments in the student interviews about all these different flavors of empowerment. And so we coded them all and labeled them and sorted them into buckets to come up with these broad categories. And I want you to do a little bit of that with me as we go and we look at the quotes. So I want you to pick one of these two topics, transfer, which is how does this kind of empowerment transfer to other areas outside of this class? Okay, make sense? Or attribution, attribution is what is the student saying about where this gain came from? The student is saying they're empowered, but what are they saying about where they got that or how they got that? All right, so pick one of those two topics to pay attention to in these quotes that I'm gonna show you. And this is what we do, except we do it for many days at a time, and you're gonna do it for about three minutes. <laughs> okay, so here's some examples of quotations from that large number, nearly 600 um, separate passages in which students talk about these things. Um, about positive self-perceptions, especially things focusing on confidence. So my prior class just made me feel like I couldn't do math. It was inaccessible, it was very hard. This math class is reinforcing my belief that I'm good at math, I can do math. It's the right thing that I've chosen to study. Another student, it gave me confidence to know I could figure it out for myself just by giving me the chance to do so. I definitely feel a little more confident in trying things out on my own first to figure something out rather than just depending on someone completely introducing every idea. And finally, a third example, and these are just examples of things that we have hundreds of examples of in the data. I can do this stuff instead of just looking at notes from a professor and doing the same thing. I can actually think of stuff for myself, use the tools they gave me to accomplish something. That's my work that I, I can actually say is mine. All right, spot any transfer or attribution? Anybody see anything? There's some heads nodding, okay. So now you've got the idea of how we look at these data. Okay, and this is to remind me to say that this is one area where we did see a gender difference in the frequency of comments. Women, 40% uh, of the women interviewees talked about confidence, 24% of the men did. So this is a place where that's probably a real difference in the importance of confidence to the students. It doesn't mean, and also because the student doesn't mention confidence, it doesn't mean they didn't gain it, but it didn't come up in response to our questions. All right, let's talk a little bit about agency. Agency and self-regulations. These are um, social psychology or educational psychology buzzwords, but they really mean ownership and ability to regulate learning or, or to choose deliberately how to learn. So here again, look for transfer or attribution. I'm less inclined to believe something if somebody shows me. I mean, I'm more likely to try to fully understand something on my own, mostly just because things aren't presented to me. I have to go use them. So I guess I will not take anything at face value anymore. Another example, I think I approach not only like specific math problems, but like situations in my life differently. <laughs> this is how you know it's really students talking, like, like, okay. Because I can think about different ways to approach it and realize why. I'm starting to realize why things I've done forever work. So I think I've just been able to analyze my own processes more than I could before. So this shows agency in that the student is realizing that she can uh, 
see what she's doing. She's not just doing it blindly, but she's aware of it, right? So this is agency. She's taking ownership over her work. The biggest lear thing I've learned about problem solving is perseverance, said another student. All right, so those are just a few examples. If you read the paper, there's lots and lots of wonderful quotes. That's the piece you're gonna like the best. Um, this is now, let's focus a little bit on cognitive empowerment. So again, that's the ability to do these things, the, the thinking and the problem solving. Uh, again, examples of quotes, keep looking for agency or transfer, or I mean, transfer or attribution. We worked a lot on proofs and how to formulate a proof and organize it and stuff, which I think was helpful in just organizing your ideas in general. You can approach math from so many ways and you can make it fun and you can use other approaches and you can apply it to other contexts. Another student, being able to pull myself out of the way, how I would do a problem in someone else's shoes. I think that's definitely a thinking skill that I have developed a lot in this class. Finally, another example from a different student. Not only are you learning the material, you're learning ways to approach problems and ways to attack them. You can definitely take that outside and into everything, even beyond math. All right, so again, I hope you saw examples of how students are transferring their knowledge, even beyond math, they say. <laughs> Finally, uh, social empowerment. So here's some examples, whoops, that changed spacing a little bit. Uh, I've definitely gotten better at working with other people and solving math problems because of this class. There's always an incentive to do your best, to prepare as well as you can the theorems for the next class. Another student, there's this kind of collective thing that builds in the IBL course. You feel like you're part of something. We're all putting our efforts toward this problem. The biggest thing I've noticed, said another student, is just sitting and talking about mathematical thinking. Not just limited to math, but really a skill that can be applied. I definitely feel more comfortable discussing, being able to listen to others, explaining what I'm saying. And finally, every time you solve a problem, you have to write it in a fashion where somebody who has no knowledge of the class can understand it. And that's a really good advantage, not even just for this class, but for anything else you can think. All right, so lots of lovely examples when they're saying, not only do I notice I have this skill, I have more of this skill, I can use it somewhere else. That's the transfer piece. And it's really amazing how often this comes up in their own words. Um, I'll just mention one thing about social empowerment. Here's another place where we saw a gender difference. And this is one where the men, I think it's 72% of men commented on something about social competence versus 54% of women. And so this is something where the men are really making important gains that may actually help to explain why women feel more confident, right? <laughs> the men are better at this than they used to be. <laughs> All right, so we've got these three kinds of empowerment. You've thought about, you've noticed some of the comments that students say about transfer. The self-awareness, right? That's what makes an empowerment is they notice they have these new skills and can take them forward. The age or the uh, attribution, when you look closely at where they're getting these, they're certainly saying this came from the IBL class. And it comes out of, they're talking about their experiences of inquiry, of deeply engaging, collaborating, sharing responsibility, the kinds of peer and instructor support they have, and their own critical reflection, right? Their own thinking about their learning. All right, so we can say that these things do have to do with IBL, right? And so what do you have when you have all four corners of a diamond? Home run. <laughs> So this is a home run for IBL, right? And you may be saying to yourself, Sandra, why are you showing a picture of Barry Bonds? Yes, he's the home run king of all time, but it's in the steroid era. He was indicted for perjury and obstruction of justice. And he uh, steadfastly said that he did not take steroids, even though his trainers admitted giving them to him. So is this really what we want our IBL students to be like? <laughs> Yes, yes it is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's legal, it's completely legal. <clears throat> All right, so just let me close by saying this is what makes it transformative, right? Not every student in your class will have a transformative experience. You spend a lot of time at this meeting worrying about the ones who don't and worrying how to solve that problem. But remember that some of them are. And really, many of these students, the numbers of comments by students about these different forms of empowerment are really impressively high. These are not rare events. They're not universal events, but they're not rare, right? So lots of students are hitting home runs, or at least getting on base, right? Legally. 
<laughs> All right. So we call that transformative learning, and this is part of the theory that Maria Lisa used to interpret this. Transformative learning is learning by making meaning, right? And that's what Ed talked about last night, making meaning of experience, and this is what they're doing um, in the class. And another way of talking about transformative learning is learning that shapes people in such a profound way that it affects their subsequent learning. And these are the kinds of experiences yeah. students are reporting to us. So that is a home run. Hmm. All right, so the paper, uh, there's a link on our website to these things, uh, or will be once they're all available, um, and, and the references are there. You can go dig them up, so I encourage you to do that. But I wanted to just frame what we're going to be talking about the rest of this session by, by sharing with you some of these new results um, about what have we learned from the centers. Um, one of the things we've learned is how are students learning, and what are students learning, and why is that important? Thank you. Gives new meaning to the definition of empowerment. Thanks. Sandra, thank you very much. Hitting a home run with IBL is <laughs> legally. <laughs> Bill Jacob. Hi, I'm Bill Jacob from the math department, and uh, I direct the Center for Mathematical Inquiry at, at UC Santa Barbara, one of the EAF-funded centers. And I've been asked to speak just for a few minutes, very briefly, about things that we've learned. And in reflecting on this, um, I realized I also teach in teacher education at UC Spay as well as math. And one of the truisms about teacher education efforts is that you do all this work preparing students to, to enter this wonderful profession. And then for their first two years after they leave, they don't think about anything that you've said because they're completely focused on classroom management, just keeping up with it and you're dying your head. And in some sense, this. It's a feature of IBL, whether you're an individual teacher or you're running a center. I mean, for the first two to three years, just trying to keep everything running, okay? So what I want to talk about, and I just have four short bullet points, are things that we then turned our attention to after three, four years had gone by, okay? These are things that perhaps we couldn't worry about. We knew we should worry about, but we couldn't worry about right off the bat because we were too consumed with other things. So I have four brief uh, points I'd like to raise. The first two, uh, the first two relate to our courses for future math majors. And one of the things we had to do after three to four years is step back and think about our entering students that had come from the AP calculus. All of you know about these students, and I'm not going to go into it at all except to say that we went back and reevaluated everything we'd done. Now that we knew them and we knew how they interacted with the course, all right? And all I'm gonna say there is we realized at the same time, you've gotta move forward and backwards with these kids. And I think you can, you can second guess what I'm saying there, but I urge you after three to four years to step back and think about these kids because they're wonderful, they come with certain gifts, they come with certain handicaps because of the course, and just, Pay attention to them as using your best judgment. And I'm not going to tell you anymore. That's very important. Uh, the second thing is with the proofs courses, we're, and I have a landscape out there from the proofs course that we're developing. Uh, the most important issue that you want to step back and reflect on after three to four years is what are you doing to affect students' beliefs about what mathematics is and what is a proof? Okay, we focus so much on the content and, and getting the IBL to work. Step back and, and think about their belief systems. And so this is an issue that after two to three years, when you go back and reorganize, I ask you to think about. Uh, In our courses for K-12 teachers, one of our learnings has been that our use of case studies, we have case studies of children, uh, doing inquiry in mathematics, K-12, is very, very powerful in bringing uh, teachers and uh, our prospective teachers into thinking about IBL and thinking about mathematical issues. So we have a video case studies. There's also a lot of written documentation on this. And one of the things we're doing right now is redesigning our courses for yet a third spin where we bring in even more case study carefully aligned with mathematical content. We look at the mathematics children do. We look at it from the point of development. 
It's mathematics, it's not pedagogy, it's mathematics, but it's, it's very powerful when used effectively and some of our research in the School of Education has really shown this to be a very, very powerful component. So I urge you, if you're involved in pre-service education, to think about use of case studies. The fourth comment is that we also have professional development in the community where you can link that to the cooperating teachers that your student teachers go in and visit is where you get the biggest bang for your buck. All right, again, another truism of teacher education is that you, if you put students, uh, a credential student in a classroom where something happens, which is the antithesis of everything that you've tried to develop with them, they will worship what that teacher does. Because that teacher is a caring, kind person who loves kids and has chosen that profession. But they could be doing something that, you know, we, they could be our close friends, but what they do in the classroom is something that we go, ugh. And that's exactly what your student will emulate. So try as much as possible if you're engaged with pre-service teachers to have <coughs> professional development that links, okay, uh, what you're doing with your pre-service teachers to what you're doing with the in-service teachers, they will meet. And when you can bring that together, we had a, um, thanks to a, a variety of foundation supports, EAF and others, we ran in the summer, I think the most powerful thing we ever did, and, and that was a laboratory school where the teachers taught IBL after working with us for an entire week. And then the credential students saw those kids doing IBL in kindergarten through sixth grade. So when you can pull all this together, it's a very powerful tool. And those are my four comments. Thank you. Okay, with that foundation, we can move to our, uh, the lightning round portion of our uh, <laughs> panel. And uh, we have Mike Starr from University of Texas, uh, Ralph Spatcher from Michigan, John Butler from Chicago, and down the end, Brandon Kelly from Harvard, right? Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, I will pose uh, a question and uh, we can do sound bite answers. That would be, that would be fine. Let's, uh, question one. What works best in getting people in your department to try IBL? Should I start? Sure. Uh, the University of Texas has instituted an inquiry flag that every student needs to take at least one course of during their undergraduate career. Well, I'll give a different uh, answer. Strong culture of IBL. If people see that there is a strong core of people doing IBL and they can uh, see their successes and learn from it, especially new incoming people, that's tremendous persuasion to try it out yourself. John? I think I would essentially echo Ralph's. I think what we've been able to do with the AF support is to normalize the situation. We no. teach 12 to 15 courses a year using IBL methods and it's not always the same people. So there's, that culture is around. Hundreds of students have taken IBL courses. Dozens of graduate students have taught in IBL courses. A dozen faculty members have taught IBL courses. And so there's easy buy-in because the conversation is always ongoing. The new normal. Um, I think that a structured graduate student instructor training really helps facilitate active learning at Harvard. And I'll add that our graduate students really pester me to be engaged in IBL because they have now found that it is extremely helpful when they seek employment. Yeah. <laughs> Quick question from the audience. Quick question from the audience. Question two. Is there interest in IBL across the sciences and engineering at your university and how has your center been involved in that? Anybody? Mike? Uh, yes, uh, there has been interest in IBL across the sciences and engineering, both at our university, but I think it's actually part of a nationwide change, that this is becoming, no, no person who's interested in education will have a discussion that does not include active learning strategies. Okay, I can say a similar kind of thing. In fact, uh, NSF has had these grants called broader, broader grants or something like this. Wider. Wider grants, I always get confused. <laughs> wider and wider. Anyhow, wider, wider, mm. larger, smaller. <laughs> um, 
So anyhow, University of Michigan has gotten one, and basically it's been used to uh, try to uh, make a whole bunch of STEM sciences more interactive, uh, more close to, uh, closer to interactive learning. Uh, math has played a role in that. We've had discussions in it, and we've actually taken a little bit of money and used it to improve on our 215 large section vector calculus course and putting a little bit of IBL in there. Okay, next question. And the way, uh, gentlemen, if I may, uh, if you lean toward the mic and be prone, I'll know that you want to jump in. <laughs> okay, number three, how much interest and support do you have from the College of Education for IBL and teacher education courses? Well, as I st after doing it for a number of years, they just brought me in to teach in the right. teacher education program. And uh, one of the things I'm very proud of is that the teacher education program now requires their, uh, their credential candidates in K-6 to take their math course in our department. So if they come from another university, they're told that's great, but you've still got to take Jacob's course. So <laughs> it's wonderful. In other words, they've joined you. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I would say it's, it's, a, it's a benign neglect kind of support where they, they let us teach the courses. Okay. To, in the, the content okay. courses. So, yeah. <laughs> and so, so we, some of them are full on IBL, some of them use IBL, but. You've overtaken them. Okay. My, I think we have a very strong relationship between the School of Education and uh, the math department. And there are tons of students taking our math education courses, content courses. They are maybe not directly linked to the methods courses, but I think what we learn in the methods courses, we see in action and when we come to the content courses. So I think there's a strong collaboration and a strong idea. So I think I can really say that they're behind us. At, at the University of Texas, we have the UTeach program, which is a, a program for, for uh, preparing uh, future teachers, but it's housed in the, in the College of Natural Sciences, and it's all based on inquiry learning. This question I got from this table earlier, and they asked me to ask you, what advice would you give to a faculty member or a small group of faculty members who want to use IBL? Well, watch someone teach it. So go to someone's class, watch it. It's, I think I've heard from several people that has been the best and most convincing experience, and it also tells you how to do it, and maybe also sometimes how not to do it. But yeah. <laughs> This is not a yes, no question. What are the pitfalls to be avoided? That's not a yes, no so, question. So we're one of the places, I'm, I'm pretty sure on Sandra's slide, where we offer IBL and non-IBL sections in parallel. And so I think we've created a situation where students have a fallback option. So we will never insist that a student take, well, that's not quite true. They're, one, one of the teacher courses, they pretty much have no options. But, but for, the, uh, for the undergraduates, there's always a, a, a uh, they can they can opt out, and so uh, I think throwing a student into a course because that happened one time where we didn't announce ahead of time that it was going to be IBL and that created a little friction in the classroom. So I think making clear that which courses are going to be which and creating situations for a student not to have to participate if they're very uncomfortable. Mike, I think the biggest pitfall is to not try it. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I, I'd say that one of the biggest pitfalls is not willing to change because you need to prepare, you need to think long term of where are you going to go, that's very important, but if at the end of your first lesson you aren't willing to change and you've, because you've done all of this work, then you're in trouble. I mean, every day you've got to do what, you've got to respond to what happened. Well, I'll say something which is the opposite of John, so. <laughs> Good. And this concerns actually our math ed courses, which I think in the beginning when we started about 10 years ago were very difficult to handle and certainly caused me lots of headaches. Um, I think in the meantime what has happened, and in part this was simply because of students' expectations coming into the course. 
So if you have an expectation there is not IBL and you're getting maybe an easy A or A minus at least or something like that, well, that's totally different. And if you know that the classes before you for so many years now, whatever, seven, eight, nine, ten, have had IBL in their math ed courses and they didn't have another option. <laughs> We're not disagreeing. But no. <laughs> what I'm saying is make sure expectations are clear. Right. Okay. So. Anyhow, as a result of this, we've actually changed our whole math ed program to completely IBL. Just, I, I would say, I mean, the credit here goes to all the many people who have taught the courses in the program, who have suffered from it, and we're doing it now. So, thank you. And I would say, hey, anything you can do that gets students to spend time on the task you give them, that's a win. Um, I don't think it's only time on task, but I will say that the students report to us um, when you ask them a question on the survey of sort of which of the different aspects of the course helped you most in learning, the two things they rate the highest are my interaction with peers and my own daily involvement. So part of it is that they're doing a little bit of work all week and they're not just spiking before the tests. The non-ideal students, the thing that helps them learn most is preparing for an exam. But what that's kind of telling you is that that's the only time they really study. So I think time on task, you know, we don't, we don't really have a way to integrate that time, but what I will say is steady work, preparing for class, being accountable for class and to each other um, seems to be part of why it works. And uh, Lorenzo, uh, would you comment on, uh, Lorenzo a few years ago went to every single class that was taught in the math department, which is like 120 sections in the spring, and he had an observation about a fundamental aspect of class participation. Lorenzo, where are you? Because he's right there. Oh, oh yeah. Basically, uh, in terms of participation, um, there were the sort of the traditional lecture classes, there were the flipped classes, and there were the IBL classes. You know, the traditional lecture classes typically had attendance around 60 percent. The flipped classes, 70. The IBL classes is 90. Showing up is important. <laughs> In life, not just math class. <laughs> OK, we'll, we'll pick up the pace a little bit with the remaining uh, questions. And I'll save a little time for a couple more questions from the audience. One, what are the resource needs for teaching using IBL? This is somebody that doesn't know how to get started, but they need to know what they need. I think it's very important to have materials, yeah, have a good set of IBL notes. Don't try to invent the wheel from scratch the first time out. Materials. Materials. Somebody to talk to. I mean, on, on a daily basis about how the class is going, about what happened, and how, how you might modify your behavior or your reactions in the, the next time around. Uh, a mentor. It doesn't have to be somebody on campus either. Yeah. <clears throat> Question, what strategy has been the most effective, and the key word here is in disseminating IBL to other campuses? Surely, Ralph? Training at the IBL centers, I think there are a lot of people who came through, graduate students, postdocs, et cetera, who got trained, even faculty who may have left to other campuses. Uh, and I would say the workshops, the IBL workshops have been wonderful resources for people to learn about IBL and learn how to do IBL. You know, I think it boils down to human interaction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next to last question, keyword, transportable. How transportable are the courses that you've developed, how transportable are they to others in your departments to others outside your university? Ralph? Well, we have these courses which, uh, quite a few of which get taught by one postdoc, who then trains the next postdoc who then trains the next postdoc. So I think there's now a generation of maybe four or five. That, I think that's the answer. It still seems to be working. And they're also changing over time with the postdocs and with the other people who teach for courses. OK, Mike. I, I would say that um, the if, if you look at all the wonderful IBL notes out in the, in the room over there and some uh, published books, uh, David Clark and, and us have written, that those those demonstrate that these are transportable things. It gives you a template for actually producing the course. Mm -hmm. I think I would qualify just a little bit and say somewhat. Somewhat. I think, I, think, I think you could take the things that we've done and modify them to your purposes, but I don't think you can necessarily just yeah. take them as is and, and use them. Sandra? I, 
I want to say that I think courses are not so transportable. Materials, ideas, inspiration, troubleshooting is, and so these resources help. But I actually think one of the things that's powerful about this is that people come to see it as a general method, as an approach that you can fine tune for different settings and different contexts. And I think that's, that's really part of the value of this kind of meeting and, and, and the interactions that have been spoken about. Um, but it's a flexible toolkit, and I, I don't think it's very often the case. In fact, the National Science Foundation and others have spent a lot of money on developing perfect courses that they then just thought people would pick up and move. And that's not how it works. You have your own students, your own style, your own context. So I think the flexible mm -hmm. toolkit is key. And then when you're ready, you say, OK, now I need some materials for X or Y or Z course, because I'm going to apply my toolkit in a different place, and I don't want to start from scratch. Last question, maybe the most important question for someone that uh, came to me earlier and says, what are the innovative approaches that you are incorporated in the IBL, such as flipped classrooms, MOOCs, large sections, and others? What looks promising, or in other words, what looks like it will really work? Well, I mentioned earlier uh, our use of case studies in teacher education programs. These case studies are children doing IBL and then you can look how each child and pairs develop strategies. You can see how the teacher brings them together to discuss the mathematics. And we are amplifying and expanding that. And that's something that we now can disseminate online to our students. So they'll do inquiry in class. And then they do what we call inquiry about inquiry when they inquire about how kids are doing inquiry in third grade or what have you. Before Mike starts, if you got a question, go find a microphone. Find a microphone. Go ahead, Mike. I'm Travis Mavis. Uh, earlier, uh, a, lec a lecturer, by the way, <laughs> mentioned that lecturer methods are usually much more uh, economical than IBL. For instance, uh, having 250 people in a class is a lot cheaper uh, in the long run per cost than in 30 or something. So I guess uh, spinning off that thought, uh, I'm asking, do you think that hardware or software technology is required for IBL or can be required for IBL? And if so, what? And would this help possibly solve the problem of the lecture method being so much cheaper to conduct? So at UT, we're doing several experiments. I'm, I, I did a MOOC last year, and this year I'm turning it into a four credit version. Trying MOOC, to, I'm sorry, a MOOC? A MOOC is a massive open online course. Uh, and this year I'm trying to turn it into a four credit version and have it include some of the spirit of IBL. The, the medium is not congenial to that kind of effort and that's why I'm doing it because it's a challenge. I'm sure it'll be lots of failures in, involved in this thing. But to me, part of the future of education is to work on the challenge of whether we can include what we all in this room value and see where it can fit in and where online kinds of things can fit in constructively together to you know fill in the dots that David Clark talked about at noon today. Exactly how would this re help uh, you know, save money or go back to uh, reducing the size of the class or make it more handleable and still use IBL? I didn't quite follow that. MOOC will somehow do that? Well, OK. So f the first thing I would say about the, uh, the attempts to do this in, in broad scale is exactly what David Clark said, which is that when you are, have the challenge of having to compete with massive presentations of knowledge, you'd better start thinking about why it is important for students to actually come to the institution. And forcing people to think about that is going to be an important part of thing, like the flip classes that we're doing and other, other things I think are very important. The, the answer to your question is this is an unsolved problem of how to get people who are out in the world by the thousands to interact with each other in peer-mediated online uh, uh, chat rooms and that kind of thing. And that's what all these experiments are about. Will it work? Most of it won't but maybe there'll be nuggets that can include some uh, useful things. Okay, thank you. Sandra? 
I'll just add that the economics of this also uh, depend a lot on the pass-fail rate. If you keep offering big sections but the failure rates are high and you have to keep teaching those students over and over again, you're not actually saving money. You're spending uh, money on instructor time uh, that, that could perhaps be more profitably spent by dividing the class and teaching in ways that make students more success. I would love to see that economic analysis. I haven't seen it done, but I think we have to remember that there's a cost to failing. That's right. Okay, do we have one more? Yes, sir. And then I'll wrap up because we're getting, I don't want to get in between uh, this and a reception at the Moore House. Okay. The, um, <clears throat> uh, you mentioned that education courses, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. You mentioned that education courses um, be, uh, tending to teach in, the, uh, in an IBL format, and I assume you're, you're speaking specifically about math education courses. What about education courses in the humanities, like in philosophy? And what about the education courses in, that are in the humanities, such as philosophy and history of education and other, other courses like that? Are other courses in the education department uh, tending, to, tending to be aware of and make use of IBL kinds of strategies? Well, since I'm part of the teacher education faculty at UCSB, I'll say that it's all over the map. Okay, as, as it is, as you might expect. And I think that's the simplest comment I can make. Yes, there are some people that have very uh, in, uh, highly conversational, uh, interactive classes, and there's others who just come in as professors of education and lecture because they're experts at the students. So, yeah, it's all in that. Ron, before I begin to wrap up, do you have any... Uh... Uh, you've done a great job. <laughs> Ron and I were very smart tonight. We did two things. We scheduled this last uh, in order to make sure that we conclude more or less on time in order to not get in between this group and a nice reception at the Oral Moore House where Coke Reed now has uh, Vortex and uh, you'll see Harry Lucas and some of us over there later. The other thing, we wanted to run this panel a little bit differently, a little bit uh, more uh, uh, in a uh, lightning round type thing so that we can do two things. Focus on the history and some of the documentation that uh, Sandra has been able to present for us. And also after uh, the number of years, we're now leaning into the future. And I wanted to let you see how these folks are thinking about the future based on the, their past experiences. And my other wisdom today is to make sure I showed up with a panel, because Ed Berger didn't need one, and I sure did. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all.